So we are going to continue our sermon series that we started several weeks ago entitled Signs of the Times, Rediscovering Revelation. And yes, we have been studying the most mysterious, enigmatic, misunderstood, and misinterpreted book of the Bible, the Apocalypse of John, otherwise known as the Book of Revelation. And the timing couldn't be more perfect for us, <laughs> right? Because uh, it just feels like sometimes, and I know it feels like for many of us, you, you look around, you're like, what in the world is going on? Uh, and for a lot of people, it does feel like there's something happening. Maybe it's the end of the world. Um, and I know that there have been lots of moments in our history. Uh, we look back in history, and there's lots of moments where there's challenge and crisis and chaos, and people did the same thing. Uh, they started wondering, you know, is this the end of all things? Uh, and so lots of people tend to, during those moments of crisis, focus on trying to figure out uh, what's going to happen next. And in Christian culture, that's become like an art form, uh, you know, trying to decode the book of Revelation, because there's obviously something hidden within Revelation and other apocalyptic books of the Bible, and even some of the apocalyptic sayings of Jesus, uh, as we're going to discover today, too. Um, and so, you know, lots of people are trying to figure that out. Let's crack the code, and then we can figure out what's going on, so then we can have confidence uh, in what comes next, right? Uh, and so uh, I know that for many of y'all, you probably have felt maybe some of the anxiety uh, that comes with wondering what's happening around us. Um, and I know that once you start to read the book of Revelation, if that's something you decided to do willingly, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> but you probably got a little bit into it and you're like, okay, man, this, that's enough. Uh, I'm gonna, it's kind of freaking me out just a little bit, right? Um, and I've had people tell me that. They're afraid to read it. Um, they don't understand it. It's full of all kinds of interesting word pictures that don't seem to make a whole lot of sense to us. But here's the thing. They made sense to the people who were reading it. That's why it's called Revelation and not confusion. <laughs> right? The people who were reading it completely understood the word pictures. They got it. They understood what John the Revelator, the person who was writing this, was trying to say to seven churches in Asia Minor uh, in what is now modern-day Turkey. All of these churches were different. Some of them were undergoing tremendous persecution, even people being executed. There were others that were becoming complacent uh, and had just kind of given up trying. There were others that had actively started to embrace Roman culture and even some of the Roman sort of religion and worship of Caesar and all of that. And John is writing to these churches and basically saying, I know it seems like everything is messed up. That's what happens in the world sometimes. There's a rising and dying aspect to this. There's a cycle to this. But guess what? There's hope. There's always hope. And you need to hold on to your faith and don't give in to the pressures to assimilate to Roman culture. Don't give in to the pressures to worship any other Lord, but, Caesar, but uh, not Caesar, but Jesus. Don't give in to that pressure and hold on because everything is gonna be okay in the end. That's what Revelation is ultimately pointing to is hope. Now, I know that when we go outside nowadays, <laughs> we sometimes wonder, and as this meme kind of helped me understand, um, we, me looking outside to see what chapter of Revelation we're doing today. <laughs> but when you start, you know, trying to read Revelation, uh, you know, it can blow your mind. And so this is also a meme that really spoke to me. Um, my mind when reading Revelation. <laughs> it's from the great Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, and the conspiracy theory, you know, with the yarn that's going from one place to the next. I mean, that's what it feels like, right? So today, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach. Um, we're actually going to take on one of those controversial issues, um, and uh, we're also going to find something else out. So today, we're going to explore one of the most controversial issues of Christian eschatology, which is the study of end times, the rapture. Um, and uh, we're also going to do this, <laughs> which, is all, which is pretty good. We're also, so yes, I know we're going to take the rapture on, but we're also going to get a glimpse of what it looks like when God gets what God wants from Revelation itself, okay? So now, 
we need to do a little bit of work on the rapture. So when, if you grew up like I did in evangelical, conservative uh, Christianity, uh, the rapture is something that you pretty much understood, right? I mean, we got it. It was preached. It was taught. It was part of our culture. If you didn't grow up that way, you might have heard about it. Uh, maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about. But basically, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer. The rapture is this belief that Jesus is going to one day make a surprise uh, and noisy return. Uh, and all of a sudden, all the real Christians are going to be snatched away. Uh, and they will be taken up to heaven where they'll then get a front row seat to watch the destruction of the world. Um, maybe they'll serve popcorn. I have no idea. But they're going to get a front row seat to watch it, right? Safe and away from everything that's happening. Uh, and then God's going to judge everything. And there's going to be horrible stuff that will follow. And everybody is all divided about what those horrible things are and when they're going to happen. and how. But, but the one thing that, that has held on in popular Christian culture is this idea of the rapture. Uh, now, when I was a kid, uh, I was terrified of this, Right? Um, because I, it just scared me, because the images that, that, uh, that we were given about the rapture, now there were some that were kind of nice, um, like this one apparently, uh, there's just a lot of white Christians there, uh, <laughs> so, oops, but uh, that's kind of what it looks like, right? Everybody like you know, dressed in their Sunday best, like ready to go. Uh, to get snatched away. But there were also other images that, um, and I'm not going to go into the, just hold off on those other ones for a second. But um, there were other images that I had too, because if you think about it, right, and this is what's happened over the years, is when this idea first uh, germinated, they hadn't really thought through like all of modern technology and all the modern stuff. Uh, but then you start thinking to yourself, okay, well, when people get snatched away, um, you know, like what happens? Well, first of all, I leave their clothes behind, so that was a thing. Um, and I was like, oh, that's weird as a kid. You know, like, I'm going to be naked going to heaven. That's odd. Uh, I'm not for that. Uh, and then <laughs> there were all these images of like, hey, uh, like people who are driving cars and get snatched away, the car's just going to crash, man. Airplanes, coming down. <laughs> Trains, <laughs> ships. I mean, people are cooking, the house is going to burn down. You know, I mean, it's like, like I started thinking of all the disasters that were going to happen because of the rapture. And I'm like, this is not a good thing. You know, but it was like, no, it's going to be great. Because who cares about those other people, right? They weren't on the winning team. So it's on them, right? And, you know, so I, I started doing some thinking about all that and just kind of how I felt. Um, and so I did come across some images. It's like, if you don't want to go on, be caught up in the rapture, this might look like something that would happen to you. Um, not everyone wants to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfectly timed photo, but you can see the guy hanging there on his gutter. Um, and uh, you might want to, uh, you know, if this is something that you're ascribed to, you might want to make sure that you have an escape hatch in your roof. Um, so I found this ad. Uh, so don't let pesky roofs and ceilings keep you from the loving arms of the Lord. Make sure that you got a rapture hatch so that you'll be... <laughs> taken away. <laughs> so the thing is, though, that this was not an old theology. This is a new theology. So for 1,800 years of Christianity, we didn't have this idea of the rapture. We didn't have this idea of all the things that followed it. It was not part of our theology at all. But in the 1830s, there was a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, okay? John Nelson Darby is there with his uh, severe and dour Calvinist glare. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. It just struck me. I was like, dang, man, the guy doesn't look happy. Um, so he was the author of dispensationalism, okay? So dispensationalism is this uh, idea that there are different dispensations of time within which things will happen. Um, and it's all sort of marked out and mapped out in scripture. All you have to do is break the code. And so John Nelson Darby, um, before he started believing all this stuff and before he started digging around and doing the things that he did, um, he had an encounter with a young woman who had 
uh, had had an ecstatic vision while she was praying. Now here's the thing, that happens, okay? So I am not saying that that did not happen to that young woman because I've had my own experiences with visions uh, during times of meditation and prayer, um, and so I'm not uh, saying that that didn't happen, but she had a vision of Christ rescuing uh, Christians away from destruction, like, like pulling them away. Now, most likely she got that image from a, the ubiquitous uh, forms of art and stained glass and everything else um, that existed within the churches that would have surrounded her, I'm sure, uh, because it was part of uh, the art and, and the uh, stained glass work of many churches to demonstrate the resurrection as Jesus reaching out and taking the hand of Adam and Eve as a sign and a symbol that the resurrection of Christ is also a resurrection for humankind. Okay, so that's probably where she got that. But anyway, she had the vision. John uh, Darby goes, speaks with her, it sparks his imagination, and he begins to do some digging in scripture. And he comes up with this idea of dispensationalism, the rapture, a thing called the tribulation, which I'm not going into today, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, his work was grounded in some very shaky stuff. Biblical literalism, <clears throat> believing that the Bible is literally true, like everything in it is literally true, except the stuff that isn't. <laughs> you know, the, the, the stuff that's obviously metaphor, right? Um, but, you know, biblical literalism uh, and taking stuff completely out of context and ignoring the cultural context within which it was written. So that's what John Nelson Darby did. And his stuff didn't take hold for a while. It took a while, but then suddenly uh, it was picked up by a guy by the name of Cyrus Schofield, um, who is slightly less dour, uh, at least he has a mustache. Um, and uh, Cyrus Schofield wrote a book called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. And he also uh, completed a uh, translation of the Bible that included commentary that became known as the Schofield Reference Bible, which then became like a handbook uh, for Christians uh, as they began to dig into all of these things. And then as the, the 20th century rolls out and you've got the Great War, the World War II, then you've got the Depression, you've got a whole bunch of people who are looking for meaning. You wanna think about a time in our history where things were bad? I mean, World War I, the Spanish flu, then the Depression. I mean, people were looking for meaning, right? And so this stuff began to take off. And then eventually, eventually in the 20th century, uh, it started to really gain some traction, but it didn't become part of popular Christian culture until the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was a man by the name of Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey wrote a couple of books. He wrote, There's a New World Coming in the Late Great Planet Earth, both of which I bought uh, so that I could read them again because I read them when I was a kid, and also a comic book. <laughs> There's a New World Coming. I love the bell bottom and those uh, people as they're being raptured. This was 39 cents when I had it as a kid. Um, I think I paid 20 bucks for it on eBay. Uh, <laughs> so how Lindsay made it accessible. He took all of that big theology and he made it accessible. But just like Ronald Darby or John Darby, just like Cyrus uh, Schofield, who also was a biblical literalist and took things out of context and ignored the cultural context, how Lindsay did the same thing. He built on that foundation of biblical literalism out of context, ignore the cultural context. But he made it accessible so that people read it in the millions of copies. And then uh, came along Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And they wrote a book and a series of books called Left Behind, which blurred the line between fact and fiction uh, and did the same exact thing. You're noticing a pattern here. Out of context, biblical literalism, and ignoring the cultural context. Now there was also a book in the 70s, I've just, I remember that I had this, his name was Salem Kerbin, he's not on the screen, but as I was looking through this today, Salem Kerbin also had this sort of Soylent Green thing going on where he believed that, that it was, the food shortage was gonna be so bad that they were gonna start making uh, people into food. Um, you remember Soylent Green? It's people, right? Uh, Charlton Heston. So anyway, um, that's what happens, right? Um, all of those things came along uh, and all built on that shaky foundation. 
And as people are struggling to find meaning and trying to figure all this stuff out, um, the thing that they want most is to have some certainty, to have some idea of what's gonna happen. So what's behind all of this theology? What's at the root of it? Like really down deep at the heart of this theology of, of escapism. Well, first of all, triumphalism. Triumphalism has to do with the fact that our side is the winning side. I wanna be on the winning side. We all get that. We like to win. Nobody likes to lose. I mean, you might say, well, you learn more from losing than winning. Maybe, but I don't like it, right? I like to win. We all do, right? Um, but triumphalism when it comes to Christianity has to do, there's like, there's like serious stakes here, right? Um, as people proclaim that if you're gonna be on the winning side, you have to do this. And if you wanna be on the winning side, uh, then you have to pray this prayer, you have to do this thing, you have to believe this certain stuff. And those of us on the winning side are gonna be the ones that get to escape. The rest of you, you're on your own. So there's a delineation and a triumphalism of like, we're gonna win. And you know what, I'm gonna enjoy, and I remember hearing this. I remember hearing it as a kid. Hearing people say, I'm gonna enjoy watching some of these sinners, these unrepentant sinners get what's coming to them. I heard this, right? So um, triumphalism is at the part, but you know what? They weren't the only ones. I mean, you go all the way back to the time of Jesus and the Pharisees, the Pharisees were all about triumphalism too. Like there's gonna come a day if we keep all the rules and we do all the stuff and you gotta make sure that you all are keeping the rules that one day we're gonna triumph, you know, God's gonna, not Jesus, because they didn't believe in Jesus. God is gonna restore Israel to the Messiah and we're gonna be on top, right? So triumphalism was part of that. And also certainty and reward. The idea of having certainty about what's gonna happen and what's gonna happen to us. To know that with certainty, right? and that there's a reward on the other side of it if you just keep the rules. So this is all part of that, uh, of why this affects so many people, why so many people hold on to it. But John didn't provide an easy way out for any of the people that were reading the stuff that he was writing. There was no escape hatch. Right? And he was just basically saying, like, this is the way the world is. It's going to be hard sometimes. There's going to be hard things that will happen to you. And you know what? Sometimes it's going to feel like the end of the world. But if you persevere, if you hold on, there will be hope. And so this is what I want us to hold on to today. That for those of us who follow Jesus, there is no escape clause when you follow Jesus but there is a grace and a peace clause. That's what comes from following Jesus more fully and being willing to step into a life that's lived for the sake of the world just as Jesus' life was lived for the sake of the world. And so that's what we want to do today. We're going to dive into Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, and we're going to dig through a few things. Um, I, I will do it as quickly as I can and as slowly as I must, right? So we want to make sure that we get this, because this is important stuff. And I want you to walk out of here. I want you at home to walk out of your house <laughs> whenever you do that today. I want, you to, I want you to leave with an understanding that you can then have conversations with people um, and those conversations can be meaningful about the book of Revelation and about these issues, right? So let's dive into uh, chapter seven. And for those of us who've been following along and playing the home game of Revelation, uh, if you've been following along, last week we talked about um, these seals that were broken from a scroll and every time the seal was broken, something terrible would happen. And we get to the last seal and all of a sudden when you think the world's gonna end, it doesn't. And that's the way Revelation works. There's a cyclical nature to it. And so in, John, in Revelation, John says this, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shall shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So it's a glimpse that John has when everything is supposed to end that it doesn't. And there's a multitude that's too many to count. Too many to count from every tribe and every nation and everywhere. Too many to count, as far as his eye can see, of people who have gone through stuff, who have struggled through the tribulations that have come upon them. Because life is full of that stuff sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes more than others. And so this is what happens in, as we focus on that vision um, here's what we see. We're in the cycle of revelation, right? So we're in the midst of that cycle, the dying and rising cycle, and now all the focus is on Jesus, uh, who is getting all the accolades, all the affirmation, uh, because Jesus has done something that is really, really important. Jesus did not do as an earthly ruler would do. Jesus conquered, Jesus retained victory. Uh, this moment is possible because of what Jesus has done through his sacrifice, through his surrender, through enduring death. The worst that the world has to offer. I mean, this is what's happening. Jesus did not come as a lion, even though that's in the vision of last week. We remember the guy says, hey, there's a lion that's coming, and John the Revelator is all excited because, okay, finally, now we're gonna see some action, right? The lion is gonna happen. And then it comes, and it's a lamb that has been slain. Um, and so Jesus faithfully endures death, and then there's something on the other side of it. And so um, let's put up the next thing, if you would, really quickly, because the rapture is not mentioned here at all. In fact, the, ra the word rapture doesn't even appear in the Bible, not once. Um, only endurance and faith and sacrifice. Uh, and so... What we see going on here is something that's really, really vital for our understanding of, of what God's vision is for what God wants. And what is it that God wants? And what is it that John wanted? But first of all, what is it that God wants? What God wants is the vision that we saw in that, in that thing that John describes, right? He describes a whole bunch of people who are now no longer uh, worried about hunger and thirst and all of the travails of life. They are no longer worried about creation turning against them. They are no longer worried about any of those things because God has wiped away all tears from their eyes. They no longer grieve. They no longer have to worry about death. They don't have to worry about any of that because they know that the victory has already been won. That because of Christ, the victory over death and over the worst that the world has to offer has already been won. Because of Christ, God has taken chaos and turned it into something beautiful. Because of Christ, God has taken the worst that the world has to offer and turned it into something that is unbelievably better. And God has taken, because of Christ, what was left for dead and resurrected it because God is still in the resurrection business and baby business is good. And so John wanted, you can put that back up, John wanted the readers to understand that if they persevered in spite of their hardships, they would find hope. That they would find that hope. 
So how do we do this? Like, how do we internalize this? Like, how do we persevere? How do we read through all of these things? How do we see all of this stuff going on and then uh, find our way forward when it seems mysterious and it seems like we don't always know exactly what comes next? Well, first of all, we need to to, uh, avoid the pitfalls of escapist and triumphalist Christianity, and we do that by digging deeper into the text. That's the first thing that we need to do. We have to dig deeper into it. Now, some folks, I'm gonna cover this very quickly, some folks might say, well, the rapture, even though it's not mentioned in the Bible, it's in the Bible because Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about in the book of Mark uh, that you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says something about uh, how the, the Son of Man uh, will be recognized, will be affirmed by God, and will be, uh, there'll be this moment uh, that will happen. In both of those occasions, Jesus is referring to uh, prophecies or apocalyptic literature by Daniel, who talked about the Son of Man, which was a figure within uh, Hebrew tradition one who was raised up from Israel who would then be the Messiah and would lead God's people to where God would want them to go. And so Jesus is directly referencing that. He's not talking about some sort of snatching away later on. And so uh, lots of people then will say, um, well, there's all these other prophecies, and other, but those things were apocalyptic in their nature. They were meant to be understood. But then finally, there's a clobber text that gets used when it comes to the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. And I'm gonna put that up. This is from the Apostle Paul. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And you're like, well, what do you do with that? Well, you read Greek. That's what you do. So when you read Greek, this is what happens. The word meet in Greek is apentesis, and it means to gather for a reception for visiting dignitaries. Even the idea of being snatched up is thoroughly inadequate and a poor translation for the Greek word harpazo, which is better translated as gathered. What is Paul describing? He's describing the exact opposite of what generally would happen when Caesar showed up. When Caesar shows up, there's dignitaries that will come, they will gather, they will pay homage, there will be all these things, and then the entire world sort of falls into line, right? And so what he's describing is something different. It's a combination of Jesus being recognized as Lord and an understanding of the day of the Lord when there's resurrection and there's completion. It's not about being snatched away. It's about being present until that happens. Until Christ is fully recognized. Until Christ is fully present. The universal and eternal Christ is fully present in the hearts and minds of all of us everywhere. Because that's what Paul predicted. There will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. How that happens and what it looks like I don't know. But there's a hopefulness in that, right? That one day the world's gonna be as it ought to be. That there'll be no more war, there'll be no more strife, there'll be no more division, there'll be no more brokenness, there'll be no more pandemics, there will be no more death as we understand it. There won't be any, uh, any sort of hatred or bigotry or misogyny or homophobia or all of the things that tear us apart as human beings it'll be gone. That's what we hold on to. That's why we read scripture. That's why we dig. And the second thing is that we need to learn from that to live more fully present in the present, that we are here for a purpose. You're not just passing through, y'all. This is your home. This is where you belong. I mean, there'll come a day when you will be present with God and you will be one with God and that will be amazing and it will be unbelievable, right? We can't even describe it. But until that day, you are here, and you have a purpose, and you have meaning, and your purpose and your meaning is to bring the kingdom of God as best you can in every way that you can here on earth as it is in heaven. And the final thing is this. We need to let go of our exclusive claims because the gospel is bigger than that. As soon as you start to say, 
I know that I'm in because of this, and that person is out because of that, then you've already put yourself in danger. It's like Groucho Marx once said, I don't know if I'd want to belong to a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> right? We need a gospel that's big enough for us and our messed upness and brokenness. And isn't it funny? It's always the people, the ones that are on the outside of our exclusive claims are always the people that we don't like or that we disagree deeply with, so deeply that we'd be willing to sort of have a front row seat and watch them get their comeuppance. And we need to repent of that, man. We've got to start having softer hearts when it comes to this and believe that the gospel is bigger than that. It's bigger than our understanding. It's for everyone, right? And that vision of a multitude that was too big to count from everywhere, defying the imagination. Imagine if we started figuring this out, right? It could change things because at the heart of so much of what is wrong with Christianity today is that this theology that we're talking about right now. It guides it, it shapes it, and we need to take it back and tell a better story. The story that John was writing so long ago. Because in John's belief, it's this. There is no escape clause when you follow Jesus, but there's a grace and a peace clause. And may there be grace and peace for you and me as we strive to do what we were meant to do on this earth. Not to escape, but to embrace it. Hallelujah, amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are humbled and grateful to be able to gather, to be here as a family of faith, to gather online in all the ways that we gather, God, we are grateful. And I pray that you would instill within us a deep sense of our purpose as a family of faith, that we are called as a family of faith to embody the kingdom of God to a world that is not as it should be, but could be, God, that we just hold on to that hope, hold on to the hope that that it will one day be as it ought to be. We may not see it in our lifetimes, but it will be there one day. Help us to hold on to that and let that hope guide us in our dealings and our conversations and our connections and all that we do each and every day of our lives. And may we honor you with all of it. We pray this in your son's name, amen.